prompted by a challenge from the band's iconic lead singer and lyricist to come up with a song that had timeless potential. A budding guitarist who had never written a song before that very night went home to his parents' house and he penned an unbelievable debut composition, one of the greatest songs of all time. Come and light my fire. The tell of this song that broke the doors out of the LA underground music scene and into universal consciousness is next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you love classic rock and pop, subscribe right now below for our daily content. And uh, make sure to check out our new merch by clicking the link that I'm pointing up to. And, and do check out our exclusive content at our Patreon. Both of these things are really important because they help us curate this channel and produce interviews, more interviews and more videos. So in the words of the group's de facto leaders, Rick and Jim Manzarek, the LA band called Rick and the Ravens were going nowhere fast. The brothers were disheartened by the lackluster response to the band's demos that were shopped to record labels in the LA area and blame much of the poor reaction to what they perceived as strange vocals by their lead singer, a military brat named Jim Morrison. I got a big bucket of tea, it's the fastest thing around. Rick and the Ravens split up, but three of the members of the ill-fated group decided to stay together. The trio of John Densmore, Jim Morrison, and the eldest man, Zarek brother, Ray. Jim Morrison's suggestion, they changed the name of the band to the doors, and they added a fourth member, 18-year-old guitarist Robbie Krieger. The doors generated a cult following in the underground music scene of Los Angeles, playing a mixture of original songs and customized reinventions of other people's material at nightclubs on uh, the famed Sunset Strip. The band was also signed to uh, Elektra Records. That happened in 1966 after then label president Jack Holtzman caught two of their performances at the Whiskey at Go-Go. Jim Morrison was the primary lyricist for The Doors and you know, then when he hit a cold spell for writing new material, he challenged his bandmates to come up with some songs. So, you know, the burden wasn't always upon him. Robbie Krieger accepted that challenge. Uh, he went to his parents' home in Pacific Palisades, where he was living at the time, and he wrote the band's immortal epic, Light My Fire. To guide his prose, Robbie used Morrison's counsel to write something that would be universal. Robbie thought about uh, what Jim had told him, and he came to the conclusion that there was nothing more universally relevant than the five elements, you know, earth, water, fire, air, and space. It's actually where Earth, Wind, and Fire got their name. But Robbie focused on fire with a theme of leaving your inhibitions behind and fanning the flames of passion. Krieger's Light My Fire was conceived in a folk music style, but the arrangement evolved into a completely different sophistication once all four members began to work on it together. Try to set the night on fire. Light My Fire was the, the result of a confluence of several popular songs of the day that inspired Krieger and many different genres that reflected the band's uh, eclectic musical appetite. The melody of Light My Fire, that was inspired by Jimi Hendrix's first single, Hey Joe. Now the spirit of the chorus, that was motivated by the track Play With Fire by the Rolling Stones, a song that Krieger loved. Play with me, cause you're playing with fire. When Robbie unveiled the song to his bandmates, the track was systematically shaped into one of the most distinctive pieces of music of the entire rock era. John Densmore suggested that the arrangement should be more of a rhythmic Latin sachet, and also push for a single snare drum kit. Like this. The lyrics were basically finished, but Robbie needed help on the second verse. Now, to complete the second verse, Jim Morrison added the lines, try now we can only lose, and our love become a funeral pyre. And our love become a funeral pyre. Krieger and Manzarek were both a little bit worried about including the expression funeral pyre, thinking that uh, you know, it'd be too dark and too creepy. 
But Jim Morrison was very nonchalant about it, you know, calmly telling his brothers not to worry. He contended that no one would know what funeral pyre meant anyway. Jim also believed that it would be an interesting counter to the song's uh, love-dominated lyrics, if you will. A funeral pyre is uh, it's a platform used in ceremonial cremations. Uh, the image evokes spirituality and ancient mythology, as well as death, which was one of Morrison's favorite topics. He was constantly straddling the concept of life and death, seemingly every second of his life. As the band worked together on building the song in the studio, the track was missing a profound intro. Now, as we go into the breakdown of the intro and the rest of the song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eye, where the frames that I always wear. If you head over to zenny.com, you'll be able to design your own glasses, color, shape, style, and add amazing features like blue blocks that protect your eyes from digital blue light. Uh, you can customize them with your own design on the inside and outside like I've done here. I've got Professor Rock on the side. Check it out today. I think you'll like it. Manzarek insisted on the song having an intro. You know, the song shouldn't just start with uh, the band vamping. So he asked Morrison, Densmore, and Krieger to walk across the sandy beach to the nearby ocean to you know, give him some time and space to focus on creating an intro without any interruptions. As Ray watched his three bandmates walking over the sand to the water, uh, he seemed to channel the classical music that he'd learned over his 20 years of piano lessons. At that moment, the various melodies of those classic pieces stored in his head and in his hands, really, came back to him in waves. Ray relived the experience, explaining that his conscious mind opened up to release all of the music from his subconscious and his hand began to instinctively play classical music fills on the keyboard. Really cool. Thus, the, the Bach-influenced organ intro for Light My Fire was conceived <laughs> in only five minutes. Ray recalled that his bandmates never even made it to the ocean before he called them back to the studio, excitedly telling them that he had figured out the intro. Now, the interplay between Manzarek's organ and Krieger's guitar during the long instrumental portion of Light by Fire is similar to the intersection of Coltrane soprano sax and McCoy Tyner's uh, piano in the reimagined jazz rendition of My Favorite Things. From the movie The Sound of Music. A few of my favorite things when the dog bites, when the and Coltrane's 1961 track, Olay. The Doors were obsessed with the music of John Coltrane. Many were at that time. Densmore regarded uh, Coltrane as one of his idols, all-time idols. Manzarek's seminal keyboard solo on Light My Fire followed the modus operandi of uh, how the Doors played those legendary shows at Whiskey A Go Go. They simply let the music tape them wherever it might lead in any given performance. Improvisation was, uh, of course, a big part of the captivating sound that made the Doors stand out from every other band of the 60s and beyond. Another detail that made the Doors different from other acts is that they did not have a bass player. No bassist. Not having a bass uh, affected Krieger's guitar playing in that it uh, made him play more bass notes to fill out the bottom of the song. He felt that he needed to fill three roles simultaneously, rhythm, bass, and lead guitar. Uh, there is some bass on Light My Fire, but uh, as to who actually played the bass parts on the recording is the subject of a pretty crazy debate. Now, according to Ray Manzarek, the bass line to Light My Fire came from Fats Domino's signature hit, Blueberry Hill. On Blueberry Hill. Over much of the 60s, session musicians were not credited on liner notes, as many of you know, so there was often no record of a musical part that was performed by a hired studio player. Uh, there are two different musicians who claim to have played bass on Light My Fire. One was Carol Kay, the great Carol Kay, who was a first call studio pro that performed on many hits that were recorded in LA area studios, including many of Phil Spector's productions. My opinion is, uh, knowing Carol Kay, is that she's said that she 
played bass on it. I tend to believe it. The second musician to take credit for the bass parts on Light My Fire was uh, Larry Nectel, who was a member of LA's famed Wrecking Crew and was a member of the band Bread. Nectel was a, a world-class musician who was just as outstanding on the piano as he was playing the guitar. Uh, the best demonstration of his incredible musicianship is when uh, Nectel played those gorgeous piano parts on Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. The Doors producer Paul Rothschild actually insists that he brought Nectel into play on a Fender Precision bass guitar, which Rothschild overdubbed to double the keyboard bass line that Manzarek played. Maybe they both played on it in two different sessions. I'm gonna try to find out through some interviews I have coming up, stay tuned. Manzarek masterfully played the bass part on his keyboard during their live performances of Light My Fire, playing the bass line with his left hand on a Fender Rhodes bass piano while using his uh, right hand to hit the main keyboard lines on a, a Vox Continental organ the same organ he used for the studio recording of the track. If a band is enshrined as a supergroup, it is because the, the sum of the parts are greater than the talent of any one individual in the band. Even a larger than life icon like Jim Morrison, legend. The Doors were indeed a supergroup, built by the invaluable contributions of four unique and distinctive artists. Lead singer Jim Morrison, an offbeat poet who studied comparative literature and filmmaking at UCLA, Ray Manzarek, who was a classically trained pianist, a keyboardist, and a budding cinematographer. Of course, Robbie Krieger, a self-trained blues guitarist that attended uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, and John Densmore, a drummer who was a student at Santa Monica College and Cal State Northridge. Uh, he loved exotic sounds, the more exotic, the better. He's also a playwright and a member of the performing arts as a dancer and an actor. Uh, the revered quintet recorded their debut album with Paul Rothschild in 1966, which I've said is, again, one of the greatest, if not the greatest year of music. Uh, the record was actually released in January 1967, and it got off to a very slow start, though. The lead single, Break On Through to the Other Side, actually stiffed. The single peaked at number 126, far from making even the Billboard Hot 100. And after the failure of Break On Through, the band was, was crazy with nervousness about their future. Uh, the Doors debut record sat on shelves, uh, badly needing a spark. A match that lit that spark was a Los Angeles radio boss jock named Dave Diamond who had a popular late night program called The Diamond Mine. Diamond played all seven minutes of the album version of Light My Fire on his show and received great response from the listeners. He told Robbie Krieger and the rest of the Doors if they put out an edited version of Light My Fire for AM radio, again, this is when AM was huge, uh, it would be a massive hit. At first, even the thought of slicing Light My Fire at all was an abomination to the band. Uh, Many executives at Elektra agreed with the band that it would be artistically wrong to cut Light My Fire, which to me is amazing that the suits agreed with the artistic desires of the band because that almost never happens. It definitely never happened today. Uh, surprisingly, the improbable dissenter was Jim Morrison, who felt that someone hearing Light My Fire for the first time, even in an edited format, would still have their minds blown. Oh, yeah. Of course, right. Jim's encouragement to put out a radio version ultimately led to producer Paul Rothschild splicing the song down to two minutes and 52 seconds, uh, shaving over four minutes off the LP version. Very smart move uh, by the label to include the album version as the B side of the 45 so that uh, listeners could enjoy both versions. And DJs had the option to play the album or single version. When the song really began to gain traction, many stations defied programming boundaries and played the uncut album version. Light My Fire became the song that uh, essentially broke the doors on through to the other side, if you will. It was uh, an enormous, groundbreaking, life-changing smash hit.
one of the greatest ever. Light My Fire spent three weeks at number one on the Billboard Hot 100, selling uh, well over a million copies. It was actually the first single to reach the top of the pop chart and sell a million copies for Elektra Records. It was also the first rock song to feature a guitar and a keyboard in the instrumental section. Jose Feliciano, he reinterpreted Light My Fire in the vein of Robbie Krieger's original singer-songwriter folk style that was in 68, and his rendition went all the way to number three on the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, Feliciano's performance landed him Grammy Awards for Best New Artist and Best Male Pop Performance. That was in 1968. Come on, baby, light my fire. For a song that he claimed to dislike and hated to perform in concert, Jim Morrison delivered one of the most significant vocal performances of the rock era on Light My Fire. Uh, the Lizard King's transfixing, his spellbinding vocal on Light My Fire just slithers seductively to an intensely passionate crescendo with a spine-tingling climax on the last chorus. Jim Morrison was notorious for many things, including several controversial performances that, of course, have gone down in infamy. Uh, he was the first performer to be arrested while on stage during a concert uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. At that concert, Morrison was arrested for indecency and public obscenity. And then there was the Miami incident where Jim was arrested by the Dade County Sheriff's Office uh, for allegedly exposing himself on stage, a claim that was categorically denied by his bandmates, especially Krieger, who was standing right next to Jim Morrison during the entire aborted set. There are no rules. There are no laws. Do whatever you want to do. Those are two whoppers in the rock archives, but uh, there are so many others. Now, the most infamous Jim Morrison performance on television was, of course, when Jim and the Doors performed their big number one hit, Light My Fire on the Ed Sullivan Show. That was on September 17th, I believe, 1967. Over 13 million people watched. Playing on the Ed Sullivan Show, of course, a hallmark for entertainers in the 50s and 60s. A uh, big Sunday night thing for everybody. An appearance on Ed Sullivan Show often led to new heights of fame and fortune. The conservative stone-faced Sullivan was an unlikely TV personality. Now the door. Here they are with their... Newest hit record. But the show thrived as a, a staple for families uh, watching TV, like I said, on a Sunday night together. When the Doors were backstage, you know, getting ready for their performance on a show that was recorded and broadcast live, uh, the producer, Bob Precht, who was also Ed Sullivan's son-in-law, he stipulated to the band that they needed to change the lyric of the song from the drug implied, girl, we couldn't get much higher, uh, to the more family-friendly girl, we can't get much better. Yeah, I think that's what it was, can't get much better. To the producer's face, the band actually agreed to change the lyric, as he requested. Uh, one of the Doors' favorite bands, the Rolling Stones, granted the similar request from the show uh, just a little while before that when they changed their chorus to Let's Spend the Night Together to Let's uh, Spend Some Time Together. Let's spend the night together now. probably remember that. When the producer left the band's dressing room, uh, Jim Morrison allegedly said, and I quote, we're not changing a word, end of quote. During the performance that was broadcasted for the TV audience, Morrison sang the lines with the original words, girl, we couldn't get much higher. Girl, we couldn't get much higher. And it's like he emphasized it in one of the greatest moments of rebellion in television history, though don't make them like they used to. It was an amazing performance by The Doors, especially from Morrison, who had a red-hot finish. As the band was leaving the stage, an angry Ed Sullivan refused to shake Morrison's outstretched hand. The show's producer screamed at them backstage, telling them they would never play the Ed Sullivan show again. Uh, the press caught wind of the alleged snub and quizzed Morrison about what happened. Uh, Jim Morrison's excuse was that he was too nervous about playing on the big stage and he simply forgot to sing the requested lyric change. Girl, we get 
as the popularity of Light My Fire continued to grow in pop culture, Buick actually offered the doors by some accounts uh, $75,000, others say it was $100,000, to use Light My Fire in one of their major TV advertising campaigns. A lot of people don't know this story. Uh, the band had a strict all for one and one for all mantra, meaning that all four members would need to be on board for any decision that was made, or it was a collective pass. Now Morrison was late coming back from the band's European run, so when the Buick offer was presented to the other three members, uh, they broke the unanimous rule, and they actually accepted the deal. When Morrison came back to the States and found out about uh, this agreement, he went berserk and <laughs> He called the automotive company executives. He threatened to personally smash a Buick with a sledgehammer on television if they aired a commercial with the Doors song on it. When better automobiles are built, Buick will build them. Also, sadly, Light My Fire was the last song that Jim Morrison performed in front of a live audience. That swan song was on December 12, 1970. It was at the warehouse in New Orleans. Midway through playing Light My Fire, Morrison, who was heavily under the influence, became exasperated and smashed his microphone into the stage floor and the show was over from there. Nearly eight months after that concert in New Orleans, Jim Morrison was found dead in Paris, France, July 3rd, 1971. Now the official report is that he was found dead of apparent heart failure in the bathtub of his apartment although no autopsy was performed that I know of. His manager said Morrison died six days ago in Paris, either of a heart attack or pneumonia. A story did circulate that he was actually found dead on a toilet at the Paris nightclub Rock and Roll Circus. Of course, Morrison was 27 years old when he died, one of the 27 club that includes uh, Brian Jones, who we just talked about, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, and Jim Morrison. Rock stars that all tragically died at just 27 years of age or more, unfortunately. This is the end, beautiful friend. In fact, Light My Fire was also the last song The Doors played after Morrison's death when the trio of Krieger, Manzarek, and Densmore played their final concert at the Hollywood Bowl in LA. That was on September 10th, 1972, with Ray Manzarek, who passed away in 2013, singing lead vocals. Bobby Krieger showed his peers that Light My Fire was no fluke. He went on to write lyrics for more greatest hits of the Doors, uh, Love Me Two Times. Love me two times I've gone away. Touch Me. Now touch me, babe. Can't you see that I and Love Her Madly. Love her ways. Now tell me what you say. Krieger's uh, first composition. Light My Fire has been remade by a wide variety of artists. There's the great Jackie Wilson. Come on, baby, light Nancy Sinatra had a version. You know that it would be untrue. Shirley Bassey. Come on, baby, light my fire. You be 40. Come on, baby, light my fire. B.J. Thomas, late B.J. Thomas. Come on, baby, light my fire. Come on, baby. And the Beastie Boys. You know that it would be untrue. Krieger had only two tries at getting the solo right on the recording of the song. Now, listening back, he always felt it was not one of his better performances of the solo, which took on a life of its own during uh, the Doors live concerts. Like I said, not having a bass affected Krieger's guitar playing in that it made him play so many more notes to fill out that bottom of the song. He felt that he needed to fill those three roles. It's speculated that Morrison uh, didn't care too much for the song because he had little to do with constructing it. Ironically, his passionate vocal on the track is one of the most celebrated of the rock era. Everyone has their own experience with this song. I mean, when my dad played this record, uh, I was only like four or five years old. I remember just being hypnotized by that, that long solo more than anything in the song. The song, it just seemed to stop time and, and envelop every part of my being and 
even at that young age, I could sense that there was, was something different, something really unique about this band called The Doors. It was the first song that I'd heard that had such a mystical force that it just seemed to subdue any distraction. It has the same effect on me decades after, even after a thousand listens. I mean, with this song, you really can't get much higher. Leave us a comment about your experience with this masterpiece of rock and roll. What are your, your memories and thoughts on the song and on The Doors? Please share in the comments. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. Uh, make sure to check out our content on Patreon as well. The link is below. Help us keep the music alive. It's so important. Thank you so much. And <laughs> until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.